So I was really happy when I found out that the theme of the reading tonight is myth and magic, um, because that's a theme that's sort of near and dear to my heart. In fact, it was quite hard for me to pick what to read, because I think that theme applies to all of the 150 uh, stories in my book. Um, and actually, it's been interesting because I'm just, this is like the second event of my little book tour I'm doing for this book, and yet they were happy that it just came out. And so I've been getting a lot of questions, actually, about magic and why I use magic so often in my writing. Um, and what I say about that, and I wonder, and I think probably to the other people who are reading here tonight, these wonderful writers we've just heard from, might agree that a lot of times magic can serve to make a metaphor literal. So though we're writing about magical things, it's not necessarily escapism, but maybe it's actually serving to shed some light on reality. I don't know. Um, but that's something I think when people talk about magic in literature, that it's also um, serving another purpose. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to read five stories that are sort of full of monsters and stuff. Um, and they are not... It might sound intimidating to read five stories, but there are only 340 words each, as is every story in the book. Um, so my book is divided into a lot of different sections with titles like The Floods, The Apocalypses, The Weddings. And this first one is from the category called The Monsters, and it is Monster Number One. It is too terrifying to... First, I must describe the woods. They are soft and low, the trees are small, there are many ferns. These woods are the least dangerous woods. As children, my sister and I always had trouble working ourselves up into that pleasant state of fairy tale fear of a stepmother, a witch, a dragon we wished to achieve. We stayed until nightfall, waiting for the trees to become malevolent, but they just stood there like grandmothers. Now, grown up, We've become grateful for the mildness of the woods. We go walking, discuss husbands and houses, but listen here, listen here. Yesterday, we saw a monster in the woods. We did, we did, listen. This is not a story from a different era. This is not an attempt at metaphor or surrealism. This is not an attempt to drag mythology into the modern world. I am telling you, it is the year 2010, and yesterday, walking in the woods, my sister and I saw a monster. He emerged from among the small trees. Other, our, woods, our woods were as bright and undangerous as ever. The monster, he had skin the same color as ours, but it looked thick as an elephant's and hung heavily off his bones. His arms were long, his neck skinny. He would have been seven feet tall if he hadn't been stooped over, dragging his four-fingered hands along the ferns. He got so close we could see his bloodshot eyes. He did not respond to us, but he was aware of us, like a commuter in a subway car. He was awful, I'm telling you, patches of hair on his scalp. Between the legs there was nothing, smooth as a plastic doll. It makes sense, doesn't it, that this is how they would appear, first penetrating our most gentle and unmagical places. I'll go out there today and tomorrow and the next day. I want to see him again and again forever. I want to see his horrible self. This is what my sister and I were waiting for all along. Um, okay, so this is monster number two. Um, and this is another uh, place where the monsters are penetrating us. Monster number two. The adults drink drinks and get nostalgic, while in the other room the kids watch TV. They discover a channel showing a gray field stretching far into the distance beneath a gray sky. This might sound boring, but two things make it not boring. First, it's three-dimensional. It's so easy to believe that this is not a TV screen, but rather a window, and if you were to climb through, you'd be standing on that field. Second, way down the field, something is moving, coming forth. The kids stare at the screen, mesmerized. Elsewhere, the oblivious adults pour another round. They're getting so nostalgic. They're thinking of certain glowing green fields. 
Meanwhile, the thing keeps coming. As it gets closer, the youngest kids hide their whimpers beneath scornful de declarations. This is boring, they say. Change the channel, they chant. But the older ones enjoy the terror shooting through them. The thing's skin is gray and thick, hanging heavily off its bones. Its arms are long, its neck skinny. It is very tall, but it stoops, dragging its hands in the dirt. It has patchy hair on its scalp. It approaches them. When they see its bloodshot eyes, even the older kids want to change the channel. It looks at them too knowingly, as though it is aware of them, as though there's no TV screen between them and it. Change the channel, they command. Someone hits the button. The channel doesn't change. Someone hits it again. Still no change. They pound the button. The thing is right there in the foreground. foreground. You'll never be able to change it, the monster says in a high, weird voice. Turn off the TV, someone yells. Someone pushes the power button, but it won't turn off. Unplug it, someone yells. But even when the TV is unplugged, the thing remains. They scream. They feel its bloodshot eyes upon them. When the nostalgic parents come to see what's going on, they find an empty room. On TV, a peaceful scene of a gray field. That one scares me. <laughs> That story is actually based on a dream I had when I was 10 years old that I've never forgotten. Um, okay, flood number two. Tonight, an old man came in and asked for honey mead. That's not a request we get much nowadays, and I kept a close eye on him. His beard was outrageously long. I couldn't see the end of it from where I stood behind the bar. It had things, twigs, and leaves, stuck so far into it that I wondered if they hadn't been intentionally woven among the strands. His hair, too, was chaotic. A bird could have built a nice home there. Walt Whitman times a hundred, I thought to myself. <coughs> this old man was not like our other patrons. He didn't glance in the direction of the pool tables, and he was oblivious to even our prettiest girl. With each cup of honey mead, he crumpled further into himself. Eventually, I noticed that his beard was soggy. I leaned over the bar in a manner that has been known to make old guys tell their stories. I didn't get them all, he said. What all? Madam. He looked at me for the first time. His eyes were golden, no kidding. There were small elephants, he said. Beautiful little elephants, no larger than house cats. I nodded. Madam. There were mice the size of rhinos and rhinos the size of this building. Fire-breathing iguanas with gentle dispositions. Six-eyed crocodiles that spouted like whales. Squirrels as ferocious as lions. Turtles with opposable thumbs. Miniature foxes living in treetop nests. Cranes as big as cranes. Dragonflies that flew faster than your airplanes. Doves that flew backward. Blue giraffes, vegetarian tigers, bloodthirsty mountain sheep, antelope with wings. I stroked his wobbling hand. His beard was getting downright wet. I hung on to his finger. I've seen a lot of sad, crazy old men, but this guy, he was different. He was not crazy, and he had every reason in this God-forsaken universe to be sad. The rain kept coming, he said. It became difficult to gather them two by two. I was stricken by the length and filth of his nails. At times, he said, impossible. Um, so just a couple more. Um, this is from the section called The Hauntings. This is haunting number three. The beautiful old proverb lady tells us that when she moved into the large and elegant house of her third husband, his dead wife started to follow her around, looking over her shoulder while she whisked the eggs, giggling softly if she slipped on the bathroom tiles, standing in the corner observing the nighttime antics in the bedchamber of the newlyweds. The husband, a doctor and a sensible man, left the proverb lady alone one evening, and then the dead wife really went to town. She ran her fingers creepily through the hair of the proverb lady, 
She bumped her arm so that a half jar of brown ginger went into the delicate soup. She became water and gurgled furiously in the toilet bowl. The, the proverb lady ran through the house, turning on every light and flinging open every window. The husband returned to find his, ab uh, his abandoned house, throwing radiance and heat out into the dark, cold night. Eventually, he seduced the beautiful old proverb lady back to him. At first, she came hesitantly like a chipmunk, then forcefully like a dragon. They installed themselves in a different large and elegant house, protected from ghosts by its curving walls, for evil spirits only walk in straight lines and the network of ponds on its grounds, for evil spirits cannot pass over water. Confident in these superstitious measures, the beautiful old proverb lady became very happy and reasonable, and now can laugh about the night she fled the old house. We laugh, too. Firstly, because we adore the beautiful old proverb lady. Secondly, because we are exceedingly modern people and do not believe in ghosts or intangibles. We understand that love is transferable and do not judge widowers for, for seeking joy somewhere. Yet, unbeknownst to you, I laugh for a third reason. If you marry another woman after me, I will stand in the corner of the kitchen staring at the two of you as you cook and eat. I will creep through the bedroom. I will run my fingers slowly through her terrible hair. <laughs> um, I will, I really will. <laughs> um, okay, this is uh, from the Apocalypses, and this is called Apocalypse Number Eight. An extremely normal man walks past a park bench, a stoplight, a pigeon, a dog, etc. So certain is he of these objects that he can think about other things as he walks, which is why he fails to notice when the world becomes paper. He's agonizing about something in his briefcase. Only as the snowflakes fall more thickly does he realize they're not snowflakes at all, but rather scraps of paper. He looks up to locate the delinquents responsible for this prank and finds that the trees are flat, two-dimensional, made of brown paper. The sky beyond has no depth. He sits on the park bench to relieve his trembling legs. It crumples beneath him, throwing him onto the stiff, papery grass. The pigeon takes flight, flapping its impossible paper wings. The stoplight changes. A circle of red paper, miraculously replaced by a circle of green, as the large, powerful fingers switch them while he blinked. The dog is now a paper dog. As it runs toward him through the falling snow, its fur sounds like the pages of a book being flipped. This begs the question, and he looks down at his hands. Indeed, they are made of paper, carefully, even tenderly, cut into the proper shape. The dog sniffles kindly at his paper shoes. The wind strengthens. It sucks up the grass. Piece by piece, it yanks the dog's paper fur off its body. Soon the dog is just half an ear, two legs, and a tail taped to a stick. The trees blow away. A panel of the sky blows away, leaving a rectangular gap beyond which emptiness can be seen. The man holds tight to himself. Another panel of the sky vanishes, revealing more emptiness. Coming apart at the, he thinks, but never completes the thought, for his arms are pulled off, his head, his... And soon, all that remains of the entire world is a few pieces of wood, awkwardly nailed together to resemble the shape of the human body floating in the universe. <laughs> <laughs>